What the f was this book? It is a beautiful story though, but you need to be in the absolute right mindset to pick this up. And usually I don't like reading from characters as unlikable as our main character in that book, but for some reason I was hooked. It's me. Hi. I'm a problem. It's me. <laughs> That's kind of like our main character in that book. So. Hi guys, my name is Sabine and welcome to another video. I am currently still kind of recovering from being sick for a couple of days, but I put on my makeup and try to make myself feel a little bit more alive. So if I seem a bit more calm, if I have to cough, you know why? A couple of days ago, I asked you guys on my Instagram, give me a bookish prompt and I will like recommend you or just call out a book that fits with that prompt that I read in 2022. I'm still gonna make a video about my best and worst reads of this past year. It'll probably be uploaded in the next week or so, but I'd say let's just get started. Very excited because you came up with some really amazing fun ideas. Some of these are very open to interpretation. Like, is it a positive prompt or a negative prompt? Or like, do you know what I mean? So a prompt that kind of like feels that way is the book you screamed at the loudest. <laughs> I think the book that I screamed at the loudest in not a positive way is The Final Gambit by Jennifer Lynn Barnes because what the f was this book? It was ridiculous. It was absolutely ridiculous. Hence why I was screaming at it because I was like, who the f are all these characters again? Well, I could remember because I was like reading the series kind of back to back, but if you take time in between the books, there are just so many characters and all these new characters come in and you have all of these weird family relationships that are being revealed. So that person is someone's nephew and now they're also someone's brother and it just keeps getting more and more confusing. And all of a sudden there was this villain kind of like thrown into the book. It felt really random. Maybe Jennifer Lynn Barnes thought out this plot when she wrote The Inheritance Games, but it did not feel like that at all. Hence why I was screaming at it. <laughs> A book that brought the most tears. I do have to say though that I don't cry a lot with books that I read. And when I do, you have done an amazing job. Honestly, it, it, it probably has to be Love for Imperfect Things, How to Accept Yourself in a World Striving for Perfection by Heyman Sunim. As you can tell, this is kind of like a self-help, self-help? I can't even speak. I need help with that. A self-help nonfiction book. It has all of these quotes that like Imam Sunim wrote down and it felt very comforting. And over the past year, I've had ups and downs with my mental health and I absolutely read this at a low point and I needed this book the most. It felt like a hug in a book form. And I think it, it did not heal me, of course, but it helped me. And I probably cried a couple of times because I was like, why am I being so freaking harsh on myself? A book you read by blindly going into it. Ooh, let me check. Oh, okay, a book that also goes with the last prompt, so that made me cry the most. Maybe that was actually this book and that I went into blindly. Let me grab it for you. <laughs> Just realizing that the title is really ironic because it is called Don't Cry For Me uh, by Daniel Black. Again, read this when my mental health was kind of at its lowest and it really made me feel so anxious because in this story, we follow a father who is passing away, he's living out his last couple of days, but he has a gay son. And he's now realizing on his deathbed that he was homophobic AF <laughs> and really traumatized his own child. And he's looking back at his own childhood, how he grew up, but because he's dying and because my anxiety did not go well on this, I also cried a lot because it made me think about death too much. And it, oh. it is a beautiful story though, but you need to be in the absolute right mindset to pick this up. And I also went into it blindly because book of the month sent it to me because they sometimes sponsor my videos. And it just sounded like a beautifully emotional story. And it was, and maybe I should have looked up more of the trigger warnings before I went into it because don't read this if your anxiety is peaking at the moment. It's very interesting and heartbreaking to read it from the perspective of the problematic father and it also just I find it very difficult to put into words how interesting and painful and honest and raw this book was. Very interesting read. A book that you bought for the cover only but ended up loving. I mean we all buy books for their cover sometimes, don't we? We say that we don't and that we shouldn't, but we absolutely do. I do have to say as well that I haven't loved that many books in 2022. I've only rated two books five stars and those I didn't buy 
especially for the cover. Maybe I'd have to go with Babel by RF Kwong because I did really like it. It wasn't a new favorite of mine, which was sad, but the cover is just absolutely stunning. Have you seen a more beautiful cover than this one? I don't think so. It's just such detailed artwork. I love the lettering on it and the contents of it as well. I'm talking about colonization in this like academic institution with like a slight magical element in it and it taking place at like the, the 1800s. It was I really liked it. <laughs> and by no surprise, it has like taken over the whole book community and rightfully so, I guess. But I do have some critiques or things that I didn't love about the book as well. Ooh, okay. The best feral girl fall book? Feral. Am I saying that word correctly? Let me check because pronunciation sometimes with English, I don't know. Feral? Feral? Feral. Okay. <laughs> Definitely. This has to be In My Dreams, I Hold a Knife by Ashley Winstead one of my new favorite thrillers. It kept me on the edge of my seat. Lots of morally great characters and you follow this friend group of, I believe it was six people. They went to college 10 years ago, were in this sorority and one of them actually passed away and one of their friend group members was accused of murder, but did he really commit it? 10 years later, they have a reunion at college and they confront each other and they're trying to figure out who actually did it. They don't trust anyone. You're slowly figuring out what happened, how the relationship with the people in the friend groups are. And especially, I think in the last couple of pages, there was this huge reveal that literally chilled me to the bone. And when a thriller book can do that to you, I think this book deserves a solid four or five stars. I think that's what I gave it. And our main character, she's kind of ruthless. She's definitely unlikable. And usually I don't like reading from characters as unlikable as our main character in that book. But for some reason, I was hooked. Pick up this one. <laughs> Ooh, biggest anti-climax. I have a couple actually. <laughs> Let's just name a couple of them because I had some anticipated releases that I thought were gonna be new favorites of mine. I think this is one of the most anticlimactic ones and not because it's one of the worst books that I read this year because absolutely not, but I have loved everything by this author before. And that is Carrie Soto is Back by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I made a whole dedicated reading vlog so you can check that out if you want to see like my full in-depth thoughts. I thought that this was going to be a five star and it was like a solid three. That's just because the first 70 pages felt like a true Taylor Jenkins read book and I was like, let's get it girl. This is what I need. Then you had 200 pages of just tennis, tennis, training, training, game, match, whatever. And then the last 70 pages, that was also classic Taylor Jenkins read. When I have a 350 page book, I don't want 140 of them to be good and then the other 200 to just be repetitive. Kari Soto is a very interesting main character. She's also ruthless. She doesn't let anyone get in her way. You know, she wants to reach her goal and she won't let anyone stop her. So maybe not the biggest anti-climax. I think the biggest anti-climax goes to two other books, <laughs> namely The Society for Soulless Girls by Laura Steven. I have loved Laura Steven's contemporary books before, which are like the exact opposite of OK. That's like a duology that she wrote, which is like a YA feminist contemporary. The Society for Solos Girls so desperately wanted to be that dark academia, murder mystery, magical fantasy. It absolutely wasn't. It felt like she was just kind of like ticking off the dark academia boxes without making me care for any of the characters and there being a good plot. The book was definitely like a hundred pages too long for me. And I did not ship the two main characters. Um, it was, no, it just wasn't it. And I thought that I was gonna love that book. I was so sad. And then the other one that I absolutely despise is All These Bodies by Kendar Blake. The premise of this book, hooked me, let me tell you. A gruesome killer, 16 bodies completely drained of blood, one impossible explanation. I thought that this was gonna be like a murder mystery that takes place in the 1950s, but it is a paranormal book. Like the explanation of these murders is so unsatisfying and it still doesn't make any sense in my head. Don't read this book. It's an absolute waste of your time. So this, maybe this is my biggest anticlimax. I don't know. Oh, ooh, okay. A book where the movie actually does the job. Have I read a book to movie adaptation book? Ooh, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Normal People by Sally Rooney is amazing. It's not like a movie, but it is a BBC series. So good, so fantastic. I was surprised, first of all, that I liked Normal People. I thought I was gonna hate it, but maybe also because of my 
low expectations. Was it not as bad as I thought it was gonna be? You follow Connell and Marianne, they grow up in this really small town in Ireland, and you follow them meeting in high school, going to college, growing up together, and they're kind of like in and out of each other's lives. They don't really know how to communicate. They have a relationship and they don't. And it's just all about being human and life is complicated and communicating feelings and thoughts can be really complicated for some people as well. <laughs> and because I am very well with communicating stuff with my boyfriend, I thought I was gonna hate this book because I don't like it when people don't communicate their feelings, but I understood it with this book. And I think the series is an amazing adaptation, but I do feel like you should read the book before watching the series because then you know much more of their intrinsic thoughts and motivations, which I felt were sometimes lacking a little bit in the series. So that would be my recommendation. Read the book, then watch the show. The sex scenes? Spicy AF? Amazing. <laughs> Best plot twist. I do have to say though, maybe not per se like a plot twist, but a book that had the most like surprising elements. I think you can kind of like, are those synonyms? I don't know. Scythe by Neil Schusterman had me hooked and like did so many things in the plot, which I did not expect. I mean, like all of a sudden characters were killed and I was just like, uh, who are we gonna follow now? Where is the story gonna go to next? Maybe you can consider that as a plot twist. A book with the cutest animal character. I have to think so hard about this because I don't know if I really read too many books with animals in the books. Wait, what am I saying? <laughs> the only one that I have read, which is just way too obvious, is that book by Charlie McKessie. Bequ I hope I'm pronouncing uh, their name correctly. The one that has just been made in like an animated movie on the BBC as well. It's called in English, The Boy, The Mall, The Fox and the Horse. Obvious because three out of the four characters are animals and they were cute and they told you lots of life lessons. This is by the way, just a really cute book to super quickly read because it has so many illustrations, so many great quotes and I think especially for children like if I would have read this book if I was a child that would just be amazing because it tells you so much about how just doing your best is already enough and that sometimes you know you're just allowed to feel shitty but it will pass and you don't have to be afraid because there will be people around you who will help you and you're not alone so I love the message of this book and the animals were amazing a book with the worst and the best pacing you then have to know what my preference is in pacing regarding stories. I don't really love slow paced books. I know that about myself and probably the only way that a slow paced book could make up for it is by having an amazing writing style that would like fit with my taste. But looking at the books that I have read this year, I don't think I've read any slow paced books. Ooh, okay, wait. <laughs> I think I have a little bit of an idea, but Arv Kwong's writing style makes up for it. But Babel, that pacing wasn't amazing. <laughs> I think that's actually my main critique for Babel is the pacing because the first 150 pages, I was like, yes, this is the Arv Kwong that I love with the Poppy War. It was amazing. Then you had kind of like 200-ish pages in the middle, which I was a little bit bored, but I was listening to the audiobook, so that made up for it. It also doesn't help that like linguistics and the meaning of words and being really like scientific or yeah, about that is just not my interest per se. And then towards the end, the pacing was so fast. So many things happened, which is kind of classical RF Kuang, but because the previous 200 pages were quite slow, it felt a bit off. So I would say the worst pacing, which is kind of like an over the top exaggerated expression would be Babel, I think. But take it with a little grain of salt, but also books that are too fast are books with the worst pacing. And then that would absolutely be The Hawthorne Legacy and like The Final Gambit by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. I just, those two books are such a disappointment of this year. And then a book with the best pacing. I think for me personally, that would actually be Scythe, or in my dreams I hold a knife. They both keep you on the edge of your seat the whole time because of the unexpected events that keep on happening and slow reveals and especially with Scythe, you learning more about that world, which is just so interesting because in Scythe, humanity is like a perfect population. People don't die, but Scythes keep the population in control because, you know, overpopulation could still be a thing. And you follow two main characters, Rowan and Citra, who become apprentice Scythes, but only one of them eventually becomes a scythe and they will have to glean the other and you will learn about how corrupt that world is and it's so interesting. Ooh, my best romance. I'm excited to talk about this. <laughs> As you guys probably know, because I say this all the time, I am not 
a big romance reader and that's mostly because I'm just traumatized by Colleen Hoover. I gave her another try this year and no, she's just not it. I despise Colleen Hoover. But then I picked up Beach Read by Emily Henry. And then after that, I picked up You and Me on Vacation by Emily Henry. And then I picked up Book Lovers by Emily Henry. You can say I am an Emily Henry stan right now. And I think because Beach Read really helped me get out of my mental slump, helped me get out of my reading slump, I would have to say that one just because it has such a like kind of sentimental value for me and it just helped me a lot this year. Emily Henry, she writes great characters who go through a lot of character growth, which is something that I need in romance novels. That's the kind of romances that I like and I need more recommendations like that. So if you have romance books with lots of character growth, let me know in the comments down below. Let's end this video on this next question because I feel like this is a great one. A book that feels like Midnight's by Taylor Swift. I mean, the whole album? I have to be a bit repetitive with my answers because I don't read 120 books a year, okay? I read 37. <laughs> Maybe, again, in my dreams I hold a knife by Ashley Winstead because of the morally grayness of it and then also revenge. So I kind of feel like anti-hero fits with this book as well. It's me. Hi. I'm a problem. It's me. <laughs> That's kind of like our main character in that book. So I thought these prompts were so much fun. Thank you so much for sending them. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for being here. Please give this video a thumbs up. If you enjoyed it, you can subscribe to my channel by clicking somewhere here on the screen or at the button down below. All of a sudden, I didn't know how to do my hand gestures anymore. And hopefully I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.